Hi, my name is Naoto. I work at Knifeware, and here is my knife collection. All right, hi, my name is Sky. I work at Knifeware, and this is my knife collection. Hey, I'm Nathan. Uh, I've been working at Knifeware for 10 years in January 2023, and this is my knife collection. So, I've always loved cooking. When I moved to Canada, there was no good knives available anywhere, except I found this company, Knifeware, in Calgary. Then I bought my first Japanese knife in Canada. Then I finished my school looking for a job and knife for hiring. That's how I started it. That was great representation of my culture and representation of my love of cooking. Now, I've been working here for more than 10 years and I do mostly a curation and purchasing and sharpening. And I go to Japan maybe twice a year, make YouTube videos and do a lot of sharpenings. So let's start from this knife here this is the first japanese knives i've ever owned and actually purchased from knifeware we occasionally carry this as well the telefusa with aogami number two in the core with the stainless clad with this one here they call it bubinga handle they changed to walnut now but it's pretty much the same thing i feel so good when i first hold them and i love the experience when i chose this knife I had like five or six to choose from and this particular one just felt so good in my hand and kept coming back to you. So, here it is. 15 years plus later, it's still in very good condition and I still use them as a uh, primary santoku. So, next one kind of goes back in the history, a little bit before that the, my first Japanese knife was purchased by my grandfather. When he passed away, he left lots of Japanese kitchen knives because after his retirement, his passion was a fishing. So he's actually got a lot of Japanese knives kicking around. And when he passed away, my relatives had no idea what to do with these knives. So I actually inherited a couple knives from him. This is one of them. I don't know what it is actually. Like I can see that the uh, Sakai signs and everything, but the it's just really simple Yanagiba. It was in a very rough condition, so I actually did a little bit of restoration on this guy. Then this became my primarily Yanagiba to slice sashimis and stuff with. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Second Japanese knife. Um, I wanted something a little bit rough to cut the uh, chicken and stuff like that with, and also like small fish. So this one here is like small deba. I still use this quite a bit to do uh, chicken butchery as well as like some small fish like a um, mackerels and the, uh, those fish like that. This next knife is actually really, really special for me. There's a Japanese guy who used to work for us and he went back to Japan, became a blacksmith. This is one of his first creation, I guess, as a blacksmith. And I have this very nice sujihiki made by Toru Tamura who now makes blades for Tetsujin knives. This is his early creations. I kind of kept telling them like, oh, I really need really thin slicers to cut sashimis with. And I didn't really mean to, you know, beg uh, a knife. But one day he, uh, he came to Canada to see us with the fellow blacksmith and he had this knife for me. And he was like, hey, Naoto-san, you know, I know you wanted the slicer and I made one for you. I'm like, that's, that's crazy. That's fantastic. So it's a really, really nice thin uh, slicer and that, that's got a really, really special uh, meaning to me. This is also early acquisition of knives from Knifeware. This here, we used to have this. Knifeware knife with the Swedish steel and it's 270 millimeter in length. This Gyuto had served me a lot. This very thin one piece steel knife can cut through the uh, good squash and yams without really worrying about chipping it. And this also has been really great knife to cut the cabbages and also really, it's just really great all purpose multifunctional knife without, you know, worry about rusting and stuff. And it's super, super thin and light. So that's, yeah, this is one of my go-to knife. Next one, 
here is another Yanagiba that was actually forged by Yamatsuka-san with the Ginsan stainless steel. This is actually one of my favorite Yanagibas. It's a really nice thin feel, very well made. So if you've watched some of my sharpening videos, I've used this to demonstrate how to sharpen a single bevel knives a few times as well. It's a great piece with the Ginsan stainless steel, something that you don't have to worry too much about rusts and stuff. And it's got my engraving on it, so, you know. What am I missing from the, the all the knives that I had? I didn't have any Nakiri. So, I grabbed this Nakiri at a one garage sale. This is made by Mutsumi Hinora, or the Ajikataya, it's a branding. White number two carbon steel, uh, stainless clad on the outside. I just love how it looked, how it transitions, how it looks, um, how it feels in my hand. Uh, great knife, and we are pretty happy actually to be able to uh, get his knives again. This is absolutely my favorite knife in my collection and I use them quite a bit and I have them, I have this for probably five years. Masashi Kuroshu 210 millimeter Gyuto. It's, um, it's a masterpiece. I've always loved to have his knife and I pulled my trigger like five years ago. I looked at probably 10 of the same knife to land it on this particular piece. So it's got the, you know, some uh, special attachment and meaning to me. This one is, is also something that's, you know, special to me. Um, every time Kevin goes to Japan, uh, he gets to do some stuff with the blacksmithing type of stuff. And every time I kind of accompany with him, I was like, I kind of wanted to do something, but the, they kind of always saw me as a uh, Japanese person who is like almost like a translator. Except one time when we went to visit Moritaka-san, um, we asked him, hey, can I actually try a little bit of a hammering? Um, so I did, and this is one of the pieces that I didn't finish it, obviously, but I did a little bit of a forging. Um, so it's a Moritaka uh, Gyuto, which I, I forged a little bit. I think there is like a lot of weird hammer works and stuff that, you know, like that's imperfection. Uh, but it, it, it is special, right? Because I get to do some work on making this knife. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's a little bit special. And I'm missing some uh, knife shapes. Can anyone point? Yeah, it's a small one. So I didn't have any small knives. I'm like, I'm very, well, traditionally Japanese people don't usually use the, the very small petty knives. Um, but, you know, the petty knives, as you know, it comes really handy for, you know, little peeling jobs and coring jobs, right? And I didn't have one, so I decided to grab one at the one of the garage sales again. Um, it's, uh, it's made by Yoshimi Kato of VG10. It's a really nice thin piece. Um, it's super light and thin and comes super handy. It's about um, 80, 80 to 90 millimeter in the length as well. So that's uh, definitely the piece I was missing, right? So it's, it's good. And last but not least, I do, by the way, I do have more knife selection collection at home. I just chose the ones that I, you know, wanted to show off in front of camera. And a little bit of story too, right? And variety, because <laughs> I didn't want to show all the Gyutos, right? Anyways, so this one here is another Gyuto. I don't know how many Gyutos I had, and I also have a few more Gyutos at home. But this one here is a little bit of special. Uh, this one here is made by a um, Hado uh, in Sakai. This is really great representation of the sharpening uh, by Mariyama-san with the uh, kind of like input from our advice, like say. We wanted to make the blade quite unique from the Sakai makers uh, by having very thin and raised up tip shinogi and a little bit more stronger heel to it. So it's got, lip, it's, it almost looks like a wing kind of flare to it, right? So a little bit more shoulder shinogi and up to really nice and thin. What it does is that the, when you're cutting into the onions and dice and scoring, this comes super handy. But when you're actually doing this, the heel still remains a little bit more stronger. So um, this is one of the first um, batches that the Mariyama-san did that the reflected the idea of this uh, type of sharpening. So um, yeah, I had to grab one because just because. So I'm always searching for a new knife 
new knife makers, new blacksmiths, younger folks, or people with new ideas. So every time I get to see those people and hold the knife, I'm so intrigued. Um, I think what I'm missing right now is something that represents the uh, professionalism of more of the mass-produced setting. Uh, I've recently visited some, the city called Seki, and it's the uh, city that known for creating great quality Japanese knives in such effective and mass-produced setting. And they do make such fantastic knives, and I don't have any knives from that region. And I've seen actually really, really, really good knife uh, while I was in Japan. So uh, I'm super excited to be able to carry them in the stores hopefully soon. You probably see uh, more knives from makers like them or the small makers in 2023. So stay tuned on those. Uh, my name is Sky. Uh, you don't see me a whole lot here, but I do a lot of the kind of behind the scenes video and picture things here at Knifeware. Um, and today we're looking at my knife collection. So here it is. I'm starting with my very first knife. Uh, the year is 2018, I think. Before I even moved to Canada, um, I was knowing kind of about where I was gonna live, which was in Inglewood, which is where our main shop is. And I went on Google Maps and I was kind of like walking around on the streets and I noticed that there was a little knife shop there. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like kind of something to look forward to. So uh, we landed in Canada and literally next day, still jet lagged, uh, I went to Knifeware because it was my birthday. And I was like, oh, well, it's pretty cool. I can get myself a knife. And I ended up with this guy. This is the Fujiwara Mabaroshi 165mm Santoku. I, I was washing it one time and I like stabbed the side of my sink and just got like just, just the little bit of the tip off and I was like, oh no. And I was like, I'm a horrible knife owner, what have I done? But I've definitely fixed a lot worse things than that and I know how to fix it now, so all was well. But this was my first knife before I ever worked at Knifeware. Um, and to this day, it's still my favorite knife. I use it and pick it up far more than anything else. Uh, nobody else is allowed to touch it for the most part. Moving on to the Haruyuki Shiso Nakiri. This guy has a pretty good patina on him these days. Uh, first thing I did when I took him home was actually thinned him out myself because I was then used to the Fujiwara, which is just ultra thin and super delicate. Um, so this just wasn't quite where I was used to it performing. So kind of hot rotted it myself and made it look all pretty. Um, I didn't really need a Nakiri, just I woke up one day and decided that I needed a Nakiri. Sorry, and I was like, this one is blue carbon steel, so might as well kind of get into it. Um, I don't use it quite as much, but it's kind of a good bang around knife and you know, there's a lot less stab potential since there's no tip on it. Um, but shortly after I got this knife, uh, my husband came to visit me at the market and uh, we just got in this new line of knives and I don't think I even mentioned it, but he went and looked at it and he was like, hold on, what's that? And he was pointing at this guy, which is the Haruyuki Zampa. And he was like, oh my God, it looks like tree stumps, looks like tree rings. Uh, so we immediately got it for Christmas uh, and we named it Aspen. I, I use this one a little bit um, just because it is like a really, really tough steel. So anytime I'm doing something that's like maybe a little sketchy that I don't think my Santoku can handle, not that it can't handle anything, but more of like a, maybe I'll put this down and then not wash it and not worry about it, you know? Uh, it's this guy. Uh, so he gets beat up a lot. I think he might have like a couple tiny little chips, but you can't see them, so they don't exist. So next up is this uh, dirty boy. He's dirty because I actually do use him quite a bit. Um, this was given to me by my lovely assistant manager, Colin. Uh, I think I was like maybe six months in and uh, he does this thing where every new person at Knife for Calgary has the opportunity to do the 30 day cleaver challenge where you're only allowed to use a Chinese cleaver for 30 days and see how it goes because it's a little bit different. Um, they're super tall so you can do kind of like a peace sign grip with them if you have like, you know, small hands like I do. Um, and for the first like week, I hated it. I was like, I don't understand this. This is super weird. It feels bulky as hell. Um, and then after a little bit, I was like, all right, Maybe I can drive with this a little bit. Like it's starting to get a little bit more comfortable and I can work with this. Uh, and by the end of it, I was like, how am I ever gonna scoop things off of my cutting board and put them straight into the pan if I don't have this thing? 
Uh, so it's still kind of a total go-to and I still enjoy using it. Thank you, Colin. This, oh no, it's rusty. Wait, don't look at that. Because this is a fully carbon steel meat cleaver. Um, you don't want to use this other kind of cleaver for bones because it will break. Um, but that is where this comes in. And this was actually really more of an impulse buy uh, because it was on sale because it has a little defect to it. So the maker who is doing these, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. You can see just a little bit. It is kind of overground at the tang, which technically makes it kind of like a fail point if you're doing things like chopping bones, which is what it's intended for. Um, but I'm okay with that. I will take that risk because I don't do a whole lot of bones. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna take him. And his name is Herbert Cleaver Jenkins the uh, third. And he comes out, you know, twice a year maybe. I don't know. He's a good friend. He looks good on my wall. So that's what we do with it. Uh, this is my experiment knife and my knife of shame. Uh, as soon as these came in, uh, it was a super, super affordable uh, carbon steel gutil. And I don't think I had a 210 millimeter gutil by that point, um, but they came in and it was affordable. It was fun to play with. Uh, I wasn't totally sure about dropping like a lot of cash on something that I knew I could potentially mess up. So I brought this guy home and it was my first attempt at forcing a patina. So at first, I think I dipped this guy in mustard. He is looking gnarly. This was my first attempt at forcing a patina. So at first I covered him in mustard and I was trying to like make patterns on it, which like worked maybe 80%. Um, and then I started over cause I rusted it and left it in a drawer for five months. Uh, but I started over and I forced another patina this time with instant coffee, which is something we kind of say you can try. Uh, so I just found like a super long container. I filled it with the cheapest coffee grounds I could find. And then I just left it for like 24 hours. And it came up pretty beefy. Like it's, all of that is the dark stuff that you see. This kind of dark section on that primary bevel is essentially the result of a forced patina. Um, but actually it works quite good. Like it's still white carbon steel, which is one of my favorites because of my Fujiwara. Um, so it's a little bit delicate, but it is definitely one of the sharpest knives that I consistently use. Next up is my first Gyuto. This is a Sakai Kikamori Aogami Nishiji 210 millimeter Gyuto. Rolls right off the tongue when you say it. Uh, this was a garage sale knife. Uh, we got it in one year, I think for my first garage sale, and immediately I pulled it out of the sheath and it just felt like a big Santoku because it's so tall. Like there is a ton of height on this and I had just come off my cleaver train challenge, so I was ready. Um, and pretty much as soon as I was allowed to buy it, I snapped it up. Uh, I was like, I was like hiding it underneath other knife boxes and being like, ah, oh, you don't want that one. That's not the one. Don't tell him anybody who said that. Next up is my probably longest knife. This is the Fujimoto Nishiji Gyuto in 240 length. This was actually a wedding present for my husband uh, who uses it far more than I do because I'm more of a Santoku kind of girl. Um, but it's got a super beefy patina on it. Uh, it's what we pull out for any sort of like meat dishes that we're doing. Uh, and I believe he named it Michael Jordan because it's a rock star or something. You know, that guy. A bread knife. It cuts bread and works great. Uh, this is the only knife I've really cut myself with because I was getting a little litty and I wanted an English muffin with some Nutella on it. Uh, and I did like the bagel thing where you cut it in your hand and then just cut straight through the bagel into my hand. I'm bleeding, it falls onto the floor, the bagel falls onto the floor, my dog immediately eats it, I start crying. Um, but other than that, it works great and that has nothing to do with the knife, that is all me. This last knife is by far the prettiest. Um, this is a Kato SG2 Petty, uh, which basically just means that it's really hard and it stays sharp for a super long time. And it's got a crazy pattern that was built into the Damascus finish on it. Uh, it's not something I would normally get for myself, um, but I had a friend move out of town and they were only taking like one or two of their knives with them. So I was like, well, for me? And he let me have it uh, as kind of like a little going away gift. And um, it comes out for all sorts of little fun things. But yeah, I use this guy for all sorts of little things and hauling strawberries and when I don't feel like pulling out my bigger Santoku. Um, and mostly it's just a kind of a pretty little memory of a friend and I love it a whole lot. 
All right. And that's it. That is all the knives I own for now. Uh, it started with my, my little Santoku that uh, I swore was going to be my only knife, and uh, that didn't happen. So. Uh, this is a collection I built over many years, uh, starting off from when I worked in the food industry uh, back when Kevin first opened Knifeware 13 years ago, maybe. Uh, and I built a collection over the years, both working in restaurants and now just cooking at home and, and building my knife collection. So we're going to talk about it today. Uh, this is my awesome satanic knife roll from uh, Horace and Jasper. Jeff made this for me back when he worked at Knifeware Calgary. Uh, we worked together in the early days. So let's open her up. Um, I do really like these these leather rolls from Horace and Jasper. They're, they're really sturdy uh, and just like bulletproof. So I'm a fan because I can't break it and I'm good at that. Let's open her up. So this is uh, my nine or 10 kind of main knives that I use. We've got a bunch of different shapes in here. Um, I'm not a, a maximalist like Mike or Kevin or some of the other folks at Knifeware. I do love collecting knives, but I, I tend to stick to a, a specific set of knives that I really like. So there's a few that aren't in here that I have at home, but they don't see the light of day very often. So these are the ones that actually get used lots. Okay, let's start from the beginning. This is my Moritaka Ishime 240 millimeter Gyuto. This guy has got a whole heck of a lot of patina on it. Um, I bought this knife, like I said, about 12 or 13 years ago in the early days of Knife Work Calgary. Uh, I was just a young cook starting to, starting to cook professionally um, and I just wanted a really cool knife. I had uh, a couple of Henkels which worked really, really well, but I had seen these Japanese knives, heard cool things about them, big fan of Japanese culture and so I had to get one. So I, I went into Knife for Calgary, Jordan helped me, uh, and I just fell in love with the size of this. I like that it's a little more narrow, not quite as deep. The dark wooden handle, the rosewood that's gotten even darker. They don't put these handles on the Moritakas anymore, uh, but they are pretty awesome. And then the Ishime finish, which is done especially for knife wear. I didn't know that at the time, uh, but that, and, and the high carbon steel. Uh, this is my first high carbon steel knife. And so I have let it patina quite a lot and also, um, you know, some of that patina looks a little bit like rust, but it, it kind of just adds to the character of it. I am not super precious about my high carbon steel knives the way some folks are, because um, I just like to use them and, uh, and they look beautiful regardless. This guy I have thinned out many times and ground the patina off and started from scratch, but uh, along the surface or along the face of the knife, you kind of see some of the original patina there. Uh, this guy, when the Moritakas were in town visiting us a number of years ago, I got them to engrave the blade. I think that I got to say ambition. Uh, I just wanted them to congrats something on it because uh, it was really cool to be able to meet the, the people that started my uh, obsession with Japanese knives. Uh, the next knife I bought was a Masakage Koishi Nakiri, which I have since I gave to somebody. Uh, I'm very tempted to buy another one because it's a very awesome knife. After that, I went to the first ever knife for garage sale and I got a couple of single bevels. Um, I gave one of those away too. I give away knives a lot for some reason. Um, but the other one that I got was this little Matsuba. This guy is, it's like a single bevel petty knife, sort of. I bought it originally to use it as a paring knife and it is not a good paring knife, but it is awesome for deboning stuff, for taking apart uh, birds. I've done skin to pig with it a little bit. Um, I do all sorts of stuff around my house and kind of, this is my beater knife. This is the one that I treat the roughest. And so you can see the tips broken off there. Um, it's got lots of kind of tiny little spots of rust patina somewhere between the two on it. The handle's not an amazing shape, but I love that it's just a beater knife that I can just do anything with. I take this out of my garden to like cut herbs up and, and stuff like that. So it's a great little carbon steel blade. It served me really well and it just keeps going and going and going. If I get a whole chicken, which I do a couple times a week, uh, I don't really buy pre-butchered meat. Uh, I just take it apart with this guy and it's super quick and does an amazing job. I probably need to sharpen this. Common theme you'll see today, none of these knives are very sharp. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's just because I work with knives all day, I don't feel like sharpening them when I get home, or it's because I have a baby, but I haven't touched my sharpening stones in a couple years, so they're probably due for a tune-up. Probably six months before I started at Knifeware, I grabbed this guy. I was just kind of loading up on some stones. I had a gift card and I had a bit of money left, and so I'm starting to get into doing a bit of my own butchery and so I grabbed myself a cleaver. This guy is from Arcos in Spain, it's not Japanese, um, but we brought these in originally because we need something that could handle bones, uh, and that certainly wasn't gonna be anything from Japan. So these guys are fairly thick, 
um, but still razor sharp compared to a lot of the cleavers out there, uh, and, and reasonably hard steel for what they're designed to do. But I've used it a ton, anything from, from rabbits to pigs. It's a little small when you're getting into bigger animals. I might, I might upgrade to something bigger one of these days, but it's, it's, I've only sharpened it once, and it's super tough, it's super sharp, and awesome. So this guy is, it doesn't get used all the time, but when I do use it, I love using it. I've also got this, this little knife envelope. This is a prototype that Horace and Jasper made for their Nakiri knife envelope. They sell really beautiful knife envelopes that they make for us. Uh, and this guy ended up being a bit tall, so they gave it to me, and I use it for my cleaver now. Once I started working at Knifeware, I went on a bit of a frenzy. Um, I bought myself a Masakage Zero 210 Guto. Um, it doesn't get used a ton these days because I have another 210 you'll see in a bit that I prefer. Um, but I bought that and then I ended up buying, I think the next knife I got myself was the Knifeware 210 millimeter Sujihiki. This guy, you can maybe see the really old Knifeware chopstick logo. Um, we've since replaced it with a much better logo by our designer Mason. But this guy's a really cool, thin blade. We, Kevin's really into, really obsessed with like thin, light knives. I also feel the same. And so we got the series designed. I can't remember who made it, but I believe it was made in Sakai because it has the machi there. And it was just made from like a really great sandvik steel that stayed sharp, sharpened easily, uh, but wasn't super fragile. And so this guy I wanted just because it was super thin and light for just carving like, you know, a roast chicken breast right on the line, you know, maybe making some sashimi, that sort of thing. It's, uh, this is when I still had ambitions of getting back into restaurants. I've since sorted my head out and, uh, and I'm in a much better place. But I, I got this thinking it would be great in professional kitchens. Uh, it's also good just for like skinning a smaller filet of salmon, that sort of thing. I don't really have specific purposes I use it for, but I do, I do really like this blade. Uh, after that, I took a little break from kitchen knives and I got myself one of these because when you tell me something's rare or it's not going to be made anymore, I can't help myself. There's a reason I have a Takeda axe and uh, Wetterling, a lot of Wetterling's axes and, and other things that you just can't get anymore. This is one of them. This is a Yu Kurosaki hunting knife. I don't know if he makes these anymore or not. We certainly don't get them, um, but this guy is just a beauty. I've always had ambitions of getting into hunting. Um, and so it hasn't actually done that yet, but what it has done is skinned a pig and it's done quite a lot of butchery at home. Uh, I added this little bit of leather wrap uh, on the end there just because it tucks in pretty deep into the sheath and so it's kind of awkward to try to pull out and so that just acts as a catch for your finger and you can access it really quickly. I also modified the sheath a little bit. I wet fit it because um, it's a beautiful sheath, but the leather lo really loosened up and the knife was just falling out. And so this guy's like in there now. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's a beautiful knife. It's super cool. And now that I've taken it out to show you guys, I think I'm gonna start using this guy way more often. It's awesome, I fucking love, I forgot how much I love this thing. And then after that, after working at Knifeware for maybe three years, Teriyasu Fujiwara-san came to Calgary, Alberta, and came to visit us. It was his first time leaving Japan for business. One of the only times he's actually left Japan. Uh, and he came to our store to meet customers and shake hands and engrave knives. And I had always thought his knives were super cool, been a big fan of them, sold many, but I just had convinced myself I didn't really need one. Um, I had a pretty solid collection at that point. And then the man was 10 feet away from me engraving knives for customers and I realized I'd be a real dumbass if I didn't buy one of his knives and get it engraved by him. So I got this 210 millimeter Danka. I tend to go more for 240 Utos, but this just felt better. His 240, at least at the time, was really beefy. And so this guy has since become one of my favorite knives. Uh, it's crazy hard. I've only sharpened it a few times. Uh, and I've owned it for probably eight years or so. I got him to engrave uh, fire sake, uh, which means whiskey in Japanese. Um, <clears throat> just one of my favorite things to drink, so I thought that would be kind of fun. Couldn't think of anything else. But it's just a beautiful knife. Um, I normally, you'll notice, most of my knives have the, the Japanese wah handle, not this Western style kind of riveted handle. But for his knives, I do genuinely feel that the Western handle is better on his knives. And, and he feels the same way. So I've got a Western handle Denka. I love this knife and uh, it's awesome. A lot of staff bought for Chihuahua knives that day. I think Ellie got the, the 240 and she, she really loves that knife. Okay, moving along, the next knife I purchased, had to have another Moritake Ishime. I'm not really one to buy a lot of knives in the same line. Uh, you'll notice this is the only make that I have two knives from. So reason being, this really tall Nakiri style 
is just super cool. I, I ended up giving away my Koichi Nakiri at one point and I, I really missed it. I still miss it, I might buy another one. But I wanted something that had the sort of height that the Masakage Nakiris do. I also find for me, Chinese cleavers are a little unwieldy. I'm not a pro with them, so they're just a bit too big. So this guy bridges the gap beautifully. It's a nice big choppy Nakiri, but it is not giant. And so it's very easy to work with. Uh, I use this guy for mincing pork and cabbage, uh, really any time I'm cutting a big vegetable, I, I break this guy out. Um, it's fun just to like chop stuff up for stir fries. Really, it's just a cool badass knife. I, I ended up lending it to my buddy Nate, who's a, a professional chef uh, for a while, and he used it in restaurants for a little while, and then gave it back to me, and it's just like, it's awesome. <laughs> it's such a badass knife. Uh, rounding it out, um, I did a five-year stint at Ken of Inglewood, our sister brand, uh, and I have bought a lot of hunting and bushcraft knives and axes and stuff like that. And so this guy is not a Japanese knife, uh, but it is my number one boning knife uh, these days. This guy is the Helle Steinbit. It's made in Norway uh, with Swedish steel. It's got a little, just a little bit of flex to it. It's not super bendy, but when you are doing like tunnel boning, getting in and around like the bone of a pork shoulder, that kind of thing, this guy is excellent. It's really good too if you need to like scrape along uh, rib bones, that kind of thing. Things that Japanese knives tend to complain about doing. Uh, it's got this really nice contour grip, and so if you're kind of holding it like, like this, uh, it fits in your hand really nicely, but I actually really like it for that pistol grip that you do sometimes when you're butchering a larger animal, because that, that contour fits right kind of into the base of my hand there, and it feels really nice. It's also nice because it has a belt sheath, and I'm not really all about putting kitchen knives in belt sheaths, but when you are butchering and you've got a few different knives and you've got a kind of intense process that you're really focused on, uh, being able to not misplace your knife is a very good thing. Uh, this guy I also take fishing. It's great for taking apart pike or trout, that kind of thing. First knife I bought in several years was the Haruki Shiso 135mm Petty. Uh, oh, it's also missing its tip. I'm a little hard on my knives. Not a big deal. Uh, you can grind that guy back, no problem. But this guy's super sexy looking. You'll notice a consistent theme. I like dark wood handles and like Kurochi black finished blades. I also really like Algami Super when it's clad in stainless steel, which this guy is. Octagonal handle, another favorite of mine. This guy is just everything I think a kitchen knife should be. It's, it's got all the looks, it's got the right feel to it. It's pretty thin, but not too thin that it's super fragile. Uh, it's beautiful. It's got a nice patina along the edge now. Uh, it's getting kind of a nice kind of dark black finish to it. Yeah, this knife is a beauty. Uh, you know what, it's not hand forged. It's, uh, they forge it by machine and then all the other work's done by hand. And I'm cool with that. Like I have a lot of really cool hand forged knives. But the great thing about machine forging is it's really consistent and really affordable. And so this is a super high performance knife that I think is 200 bucks or so. Uh, it's just a, it's a nice balance for me, um, especially nowadays, I got other stuff to pay for, got a mortgage, I can still buy some really cool badass knives, um, but not totally break the bank doing so. And the most recent addition to my collection is, um, is my Masashi Kokuin Kobunka. Uh, this guy is a friggin' awesome knife. Um, similar sort of deal, I've always been a fan of Masashi Sans knives. And I was just like, ah, oh, maybe I'll get one one day. It wasn't like top of my list. It wasn't anywhere near the top of my list. And then he was coming to Calgary and I really kind of thought I should get a knife engraved by him. But then I took a look at these new lines he's made, the Kokuin and the Kaijin. And oh my God, they are incredible. They're crazy light and thin, especially at the edge. He's also got this really smart way of sharpening knives where it's thicker at the heel and thinner at the tip, which makes them really good for push cutting or just for like, cutting up onions, also helps the edge stay sharp longer because the back of the knife doing the more aggressive work is um, is a little tougher. But I mean, just look at this knife, it's super sexy. It's it's just just gorgeous. Again, all the things I like, dark wooden handle, Kurochi finished blade, uh, this Kiritsuki tip, which I actually, this is my first knife in that style, surprisingly. Um, I'm not a fan of having like a matching set of Japanese knives, uh, but I think it's kind of fun that a lot of these are visually consistent. So when you look at my knife wall, it's a lot of dark handles and a lot of dark blades. It, it looks pretty cool, especially because I've got like a white backsplash. Uh, yeah, just, just a badass knife, incredibly cool feeling. Uh, Masashi-san is an absolute lovely guy. He engraved my daughter's name in the other side. It's pretty faint, you might not be able to see it, but it's just a, just a beautiful, beautiful blade. And yeah, after owning one of his knives, I, I know that I definitely need more of them. Uh, so that's my knife kit. Uh, in future, I'll probably add a Tsujihiki, maybe a Deba. 
you know, there's lots of knives I have my eyes on, but those those are a couple that I, I really want. And I think probably a Santoku. Uh, I do have a Santoku, which I've since given to my spouse. Uh, and so I might get a Masashi or something along those lines. But uh, but this kit does me really well. Um, a few of these got used in kitchens for, for a number of years, and now they get used in my own home kitchen. Uh, and, and I get a lot of joy out of cutting with them and just getting to look at them every day. They live on knife magnets and they look beautiful sitting there. So yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. I'm sure the collection will never stop growing, but, uh, but I'm pretty happy with where it's at now.